Baria, the free peoples of the Harima and humans, a faction focused on steampunk black powder weaponry and high damage melee units. In this second of my faction guide videos, I want to help you out in discussing the many aspects of each of the factions within the game. We'll start out by going over a general faction overview, units, wielders, and then close the video out talking about spells and skills as well as building priority. I've said this in my previous video on the Barony of Loth, linked in the upper right corner, but just to reiterate, Songs of Conquest is very much about playing the game that you want, not trying to maximize every single little move. There are a lot of different ways to approach the game, going wider with a larger army or perhaps taller with a more elite army. So while this guide is meant to give you a sense of better understanding of Baria, I truly believe or encourage you to find a playstyle that really fits what you look for in a game. Min-maxing the game isn't going to net you that much more of a benefit compared to immersing yourself in a style that is all your own. With that, you can navigate to each of the sections outlined above using the chapters in both the timeline and the description. And if you end up enjoying this video, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. I'll be covering Songs of Conquest with tons of guides, streams, and other fun videos in the future. Let's get started here on our faction guide for Baria. So to start us off, let's go through a little faction overview of Baria. And Baria itself is its a very interesting faction. When we talked about Barony of Loth, we had the mechanic of being able to resurrect any of our human units as undead units. Now, Baria doesn't get such a cool kind of faction mechanic, right, where they can leverage that cool ability that's always going to be present. But instead, Baria really focuses on really strong ranged units in their musketeers and their final tier weapon, a human cannon and then really really strong but weak defense melee units that's really the kind of overall focus that you're gonna see and when we jump into the units in just a little bit you're gonna kind of see that come to the fore and I think that Baria on paper doesn't look as um, I guess as appealing as Barony of Loth which everyone kind of really wants to go for that undead faction or the knightly Arleon or even the Lizardmen right it's it's a very different faction because it's very unique and it ha and it pulls from a bunch of different um aesthetics and it, it really just I think that the Barony of Loth is straightforward and Arleon is straightforward even Rana is more straightforward than Baria which you do have to kind of protect a little bit and there are some pretty cool tricks that we can get into when we talk about the units like I said in just a little bit here and you'll find that you can hit a pretty good power spike with Baria, but you also have to be really mindful of how you're playing the game. The units you're playing with are not the most durable. In fact, almost no one gets a shield, so you're not going to be dealing with any kind of damage mitigation from ranged weapons. So with that being said, you want to produce a lot of wielders when you are playing as Baria to ensure that you are getting a lot of map control out. You want to get all the little tiny bits of resources that you can, everything and kind of lock it all up, because if you don't, you'll find it, it's, you're, you will find that you will be in a situation where you're fighting a long war of attrition where the more durable units of the other factions can outlast a longer prolonged siege on your territory if you don't have enough wielders, if you don't have enough resources to constantly keep your armies supplied. So that's just kind of your general faction overview here. Let's go now into some units and a discussion thus of. So here we are with the troops of Baria, and we're going to find some really fun things to talk about here because Baria really focuses on a mechanic called weight. And we typically see this in other tactical RPGs or, or uh, strategy games of the similar ilk like Age of Wonders and the such where rather than taking the turn with your selected unit, you wait until the end of the turn, that combat round, and you can use that unit. Baria has access to that via an ability. Not many people in the game do. It's pretty much Baria that gets a, a very good exclusive access to it. So let's take a look here at these units. And really from the start, you get a really strong unit in the Pipers because these guys give five initiative to friendly units, which is nice, but really the big thing that's great about them is their upgrade. These steam pipes are amazing because they give 10 melee offense and 10 range defense. Now here's a big strategy I want you to focus on. You have nine slots to take advantage of, right? And in the early game, you do really kind of find that you, you, you occupy three to four slots way more often than you would you know five or six because it takes some time to scale into some of the upper tier units here especially from a resource cost or building standpoint so what i want you to think about is the steam pipers take two stacks of them 
They don't need to be full stacks. You could even just have a stack of 50 and a one single guy in another stack. The reason behind this is this ability for the coin in my hand, it stacks. So if you've got two stacks of steam pipers, you'll get 20 melee offense and 20 ranged offense for the entire army every turn. Also crucial, you can use this ability as long as you've not moved their entire movement in a, in a combat round. So what you want to do is move them to the very, the very back of your line and then use this. Because this way the archers that want to shoot them, they have to displace and move quick, move closer to them. So this is a great way to keep them more alive. Is that a term? More alive? Uh, aliver? That's also not a thing. But it keeps them it keeps them healthy, and you're getting a lot of buffs. And to be fair, I, I probably wouldn't put just one in a unit because that can get destroyed very quickly. So um, I would probably split, if I was looking at this, I'd split this into two units of six just to kind of keep two different buffs going. And it's super beneficial. It is super beneficial. Moving into the next unit, we have the Picaneers, the Picaneers. And they're very interesting because they attack at an increased range. And that is nice because you get a little bit more reach. And initially, you'll find that they are strong, but they take the, but their upgrade really makes them shine. And we'll, I was going to talk about some magic stuff, but we'll wait until the next unit. Um... And then we can see here with the veteran Pikineers, we get the ability to do a spear wall. Now this is where this unit shines. So basically what happens is you establish a, uh, a spear wall and you press the ability. It's the same thing like all their abilities in the game. As long as you've not moved your max movement, you can still do it in that turn. And you establish spear wall and anyone who comes within your range, your, your attack range, immediately gets hit. So the way I like to use these characters is by taking a look at the enemy's movement, see where their max movement is, place these just out just within that max movement so that they will they'll get stabbed as soon as they come into spear wall range. And they're a really good unit. The problem is that they do have really low defense at seven then to 13 if you look over here at the steam pipers they've got the same defense so you're dealing with a very glass kennedy style of unit it does have the advantage of having a melee range increase but this is a this is a trope that you're going to see throughout this entire faction so keep that in mind it is like i said a glass cannon faction now into the musketeers we get the first tried and true range unit and it's a very strong tried and true range unit three to five damage here um it, it's a really really good unit because it's going to be doing some good damage and it has the ability to aim once you jump up into the veteran musketeers going to be going to five to eight damage um, a nice good amount of range here too because you're going to be at six range with four deadly over here at six and four as well and then you also get the ability to aim. The downside to these is they do have to reload, so it will be a little cumbersome. It, depending on your slots in your army, you can have two separate units of these just to maximize the amount of shots you can get per round. Um, but here's one thing I wanna point out for these first three characters. They all focus on order essence, meaning if you were to decide to play a caster for this faction and you focused on order, you would be just up to your balls in order <laughs> essence within like one round of combat so take that into consideration we'll talk about it more when we go into the spell section of this video but i did want to just point that out right now because it is a pretty important thing to notice that all this is just order 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 now moving into our next unit the dreth we have easily my favorite unit in the entire army and i think i'm just gonna be i'm gonna speak generally here it's the best unit it is easily the best unit in its first iteration not so amazing you might be looking at this going why is this even good it's got a four defense and it's not going to even do that much damage sure it gets quick meaning this troop will retaliate first so if someone attacks this the little uh these little um baboons from no, these, these are not baboons these hyenas these hyenas then they will uh do their attack before that enemy does theirs that's what a retaliate first means but it's their upgrade the dire draft is amazing so your defense goes from four to 13. so again just kind of matches these but still it's 13. and here's what makes this so damn good they've got quick meaning again the troop will retaliate first but they're persistent so they will infinitely retaliate first i have had battles where i've thrown these guys in the front line 
everyone goes and attacks them in melee and they kill everyone before that they have a chance to actually get their damage out because they retaliate first. If you buff them with two sets of steam pipers and then use the order ability to buff them more with their damage, boom, you're going to be doing, actually I think it might be a chaos ability. Uh, but either way, you'll be doing so much damage with them. And a nice thing here, too, is the ability to wait. This is our first unit we get that's got wait on it. And when you use wait, you postpone your turn until the end of that combat round, like I've said before. So you wait for everyone to displace and move around, and then you move the Dire Dreth so that they are within their engagement zone. So they have no choice. At this point, they're either going to attack your Dreth or get an attack of opportunity right on their butt. It's a really great unit. I think it is, again, like I've said, the best unit in the entire army. Now, moving forward, we get the highest defense unit. Uh, is it the highest defense unit? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think so. Yeah, it is. I was pretty sure, but I wanted to make sure. So the Brute here is the highest defense unit, and it is a bit of a tank. It, it has a low unit cap at 10, which is unfortunate. Um, but it does do, actually I think it might be 20, um, it does do a spicy amount of damage. 12 to 16 which eat with each swing. Um, oh no, max troop size says 10 right there. I'm, I'm stupid. But the big thing with these guys is of course that defense capability that is really nice. So you'll be absorbing some hits with these. Now the Scarred Brutes, you do get a good jump here, right? You're getting 20 more health. You're going to jump your melee offense from 28 to 34, and your defense goes from 17 up to 25, the true highest defense. But the problem I have with them is they are too high of a cost for what they do. And that, that's a, a personal opinion. I, in this playthrough, really struggled getting Ancient Amber, so that meant I had a hard time getting Scarred Brutes. And I think that for what they do, you know, they, they intimidate, which reduces defense and initiative to anyone around it, which is nice. But it relies on you buffing its movement to get it into range to do such things. And I think that the Brute itself is really there just to take some damage so that I can get hits in with my Dire Dreths, shoot things apart with my Musketeers, and then kill stuff with my Shadows. Which... I think probably the developers probably intended that for the Brute. You know, hey, just put this as a big, large distraction Carnifex, throw it in the front line. People think they'll have to burst it down. It's got a high defense and a high health. It'll absorb the shots. So that, with that being said, yeah, I could see that as its role. And it does fit that as its role. But I think as far as large double hex creatures that I see across Loth or Arleon, I get so much more utility out of those units than I do the Scarred Brutes. The Scarred Brutes are just too slow, their defense is not as high, and they don't really do enough damage to make them something I want to invest a ton of points in. Now, it's not to say that I don't like using them, because I definitely do, but if I had to prioritize something, it wouldn't be the Scarred Brutes. It would definitely be these Dire Dreths and then the Shadow uh, uh, down the road. Next up, though, is our Tinkerers, another unit that is really weird to me personally i haven't found an amazing use case for them and i find them to be a little lackluster it, to be fair too i did get i did wait to get them online it's nice if you have them in the starting portions of the game because your character has them as, as part of his uh initial um troop out or uh, uh what's it called uh, uh uh starting units starting units but when you go from the tinkerers down here into the artificier Again, I just don't really find him that amazing. The flame attack is cool because it, it deals damage to troops behind the target, so you can stack up some damage, which is very nice. But with a 20 max troop, max troop size, the ability to get this building out a little bit later because it doesn't lend itself to double unit production, I find it to be just a little bit less of a priority for me. Uh, the placing of the mines is cool and all. Place a mine in front of the troop, which damages equal to 10x the amount of troops in the unit. So if you've got 20, it'll do 200. That's great. Um, I don't know though if that's amount of the unit when placed or amount of the unit present, right? So if I had a unit of 20 of 20 and it gets killed down to nine, what's the damage value? So I don't really know. But mines do hurt you, so you can accidentally walk on a mine, so be mindful of that. Well, I didn't mean for that to be kind of a punny little thing. But again, I just, 
I don't find them as useful as a lot of the other units in the army. They do have a nice amount of damage at 10 to 14, right? Like you compare that over here, 18 to 24, 4 to 7. So they do have good actual damage. So they, they, they can do a nice cone in front of them and hit some stuff. But I think I'd rather... I'd rather that this unit was like further down over here and cheaper and and kind of push everything up a slot because I feel like this character doesn't it feels weird to be a top three unit of, of this army to be totally honest moving into the other unit that I think is my favorite outside the dress the Sassanids so you have your assassins here who have a pretty cool capability to backstab troop enemies can't retaliate it's just you don't have to be in their back it's just the name of the, the uh, ability here. You can be in their front, the side, it doesn't matter. And true to their their uh, their profile, they do a lot of damage. 16 to 18 with 31 melee offense. Their defense is not low. It's 15. I mean, that's still pretty considerable talking about how low the overall defense of Baria is. And I still really think that they, they shine as soon as you jump into the shadows. I mean, they're, they're great as assassinates, but shadows, they're 26 to 30 damage with 45 melee offense. Now, keep that in mind. You're buffing this with this dude over here who's giving you offense from both ranged and melee um, uh, focuses. So you're jumping up his melee offense even more. Defense is 21 here. Movement 5, initiative 31. So the cool thing about this is he also has ability wait, just like our little bros over here. So what you do is you start the combat round, you press wait on the shadows, you buff with your pipers, you let the entire enemy army move, you'll come back to both the dire dreath and the shadows by the end of your combat round, and that's when you get crazy. You send them both after one hard target, you split them up and try and create zones of control around other units so they cannot move and they're locked down and the shadow won't be retaliated while these guys are gonna get infinite retaliation. The shadow and the dire dreath just work so well together that it makes Barrio's army really work because you now have a lot of supporting shots in from the big boys in the, over the front from your musketeers and you have a lot of buffs coming in from your steam pipes i think that like that it kind of creates this really good synergy between all these units that they can harass and lock down other units they are also stealthy so they can ignore zones of control I meaning they can they can move out of combat in the next round so basically if you think about this again if, I, if i'm creating this in your brain properly combat round starts you press wait the end of the combat round comes up you move your shadows into range and you attack the next round starts your shadows will probably go first with 31 initiative and that's when you either attack again and finish off something you couldn't kill or you use stealthy ignore the zone of control and move them out of combat so you have a lot of ways to use these guys and either harass and lock things down swing in then swing out Swing in and double swing in. You, you can just use these guys in so many different ways, and I think they work so well in conjunction with the Dreth and whatnot. Moving into the top tier unit, we have got the Hell Breath, your big bad cannon here. And it does a lot of damage. And the cool thing is that its range is 8 with a deadly range of 5. Compare that to the Musketeer, range of 6, deadly range of 4. So it's got a ton of range on it. It's got a good initiative, and it's got a lot of range defense. Uh, I'm sorry, range offense. But it still does have a considerable amount of defense at 16, because it is your centerpiece unit. It does need to reload, though, and it also is helpless, meaning it cannot retaliate. In fact, I don't think you'd really ever want to put these guys in combat, so... Getting them into combat at that point is going to be scary anyway. Barrage, though. Ranged attacks also damage all surrounding troops. So the cool thing here, though, is once you get this to the next level, to the Hell Roar, you're doing more damage. Your range goes from 9... Uh, no, no, no. Say the same. Says, oh, no. It does go up 1. does go up 1. Both your range and your deadly range. Your ranged offense is going to go from 42 to 59. You're going to go from 16 to 20 to 25 to 30. Max troop size 5, which makes sense right here, right? But here's where this gets spicy. First, you've got inspiring, meaning you put these guys next to your veteran musketeers, and they're going to do five more ranged offense, and they're going to get a buff to their initiative. Better yet, you start them right next to, say, your musketeer and a dire dreath or a shadow, and you're going to buff their initiative and their melee offense. 
which is great. But you also have the ability to wait on these guys. So here is the benefit. You start the combat round. Initiative 28, you're probably going to be going pretty quickly. You press wait. The enemy moves their troops and they get clumped up. Maybe if you're using a certain map that allows for natural choke points, whatever it is. And then you use the Hell Roars Barrage and just hit clumps of units. That's how you really use that await capability. You bait the enemy into displacing themselves to put themselves in advantageous locations for you to reap the benefit of. So like I've said, Bombaria is... Bombaria? Baria is really not about getting up front and personal and destroying things like, say, Loth. Loth is slow, plotting, gets in the face, does the damage. Or Arleone, who's got just defense out the gills. This is a this is an army <clears throat> that all that is all about placement, that is all about using your abilities to make sure that you are in a very good place to do your max amount of damage, or trick people into thinking they can kill the Dire Dress and have them just get killed in droves. So... I really, really do like the uh, Barian army, and I think that it takes time to wrap your brain around it because it plays differently than the other three factions, I think, in probably the most overt way. <laughs> but I think that once you kind of realize the synergy between a lot of these, it will really start to click with you. One thing that I did not talk about in my Barony of Loth video is research, and I just want to just point out some really quick things here. With the research tree for Baria, I think that the Foundry is a little bit better than the Merchant's Guild because I don't find that unit quantity is so much of an issue or getting specific types of essences is as much of an issue as the defense or offense of my units being buffed being a higher priority for me. Especially, of course, the Dress Drills, which increases the melee offense to my Dress by 10, 10, and 10, or the offense to my Sassanids and Shadows. Those two things are really, really huge. The unfortunate thing, though, is the Dress is a beast, not a human or a Harima, so it cannot take advantage of any of these buffs. But your Shadows are Harima, your um, your Big Daddies, your, your uh, Hell Breaths and Hell Roars are humans, Keep that in mind, so you can take advantage of those buffs right there. Um, I really like stuff like the range offense because you will be using a lot of these musketeers in the early game, but you can also get a lot of benefits to them. But I really think that buffing up your Dreth is huge, and I think that's why the Foundry just kind of wins over the Merchant's Guild for me. Just a quick little note on this because I didn't cover it in my last video and I will cover it for all the rest of them and it might be one that people get stuck up on and I think that this is really the way, the way to go. Alright, now let's talk about wielders. I'm going to bring up the codex for this because they're just in a nice list. Makes it a little bit easier to go through. And we'll start with the first one, Aaliyah here. Now, she has a focus more on the ranged portions of Baria and that's great. She has five offense and five defense though, so you're, you're not going to get a lot of buffs from her innate skills. She can move one more than pretty much every other wielder, which is okay. But I think that she starts with she starts with five musketeers, archery, and then ranged offense as a specialization. These are all great things if you want to focus on the range portion of the game. And I think that if you start off with her, you can then get access to your um uh, your pipers right out the gate and you can buff these guys up and they'll be doing a ton of damage this the problem is that with reload it, it, you you do have to be mindful of them getting killed quickly in the early game when you don't have enough actual ground units to um absorb the hits i think she's a much better second or higher uh, wielder because you'll have already established a set fortress you'll have gotten a lot more of your units produced then she really shines so i don't think she's a good starting one but i think she's a really great wielder to have after the fact uh bigly here is another interesting one because he has tinkerers and pikineers or pikineers so you start with um some good upfront melee damage units with both um, of course the pikineers being a little bit more defensive in their overall royal role but he is a chaos caster so that is his big focus here he starts with chaos and his specialization gives him one additional chaos essence so if you want to go heavy into the chaos spells this is going to be the guy for you everthink is the one that i first initially started off with because i liked his higher defense um i think for first initial 
wielder, I enjoy that higher defense a little bit more, but I think after playing Baria more, I would have gone with a different character, and we'll get to him in a bit. But he starts with two brutes and two tinkerers, your top four and no, number four, number three units. So those units, again, I think really suffer in the early game. I did, I was able to kind of get a lot of use out of those brutes in the very early game, but I think that at such a low unit count, you can't do any like auto resolve or, or quick battle portion you have to manually fight them or else the ai will accidentally kill them off he does start with cunning which will help out the initial damage offense and initiative of your units i think it's initiative we'll take a look it's defense it's defense it's it's melee offense ranged offense and melee in the first two rounds and then after that you can progress it to the first three rounds so it is a nice buff in that initial portion um I just personally think that you could get better use from a different wielder in this initial starting area. Mary here is going to focus on your musketeers, your tinkerers, and then also gets learning and range. So all these guys will have increased range that are in their um, that are range units. Um, learning is really great for getting these characters up in level. So I think she's a really good first or maybe even second wielder just to get a lot of really quick levels on her without having to learn learning after her first level. Um, but overall, a pretty good, just well-rounded one nonetheless. Namander Breeze is another really solid one, and I think one of my favorites for Baria here. He's got a lot of offense at 10, 5 defense, but he comes with 10 Pipers and 6 Pikeneers, which is a really good little starting army there because you can give him, you can buff up those Pikeneers with some, some initiative, and then you can um, fill that out if, they're, if he's a second or third wielder, what have you. But he starts with combat training, which I really like. It's going to increase damage all the way to level 3, which is going to increase by 20% damage and 1 retaliation, which I think is a great little bonus there. Um, <clears throat> also, he gets income plus 200, so I like this guy a lot. I think he's a really, really strong one. Not my top pick, but my number 2, probably. Rosewater here forgoes a skill for 2 Sassanids in his starting troops and 10 offense. So definitely, of course, up close and personal, wants to get that damage in. But with one brute, brute one Piper as well, as it is specialization in one Destruction Essence. Um, again, I don't really... I'm not a huge fan of this guy. Uh, the 2 Sassanids is cool. Maybe it's great in the, in the later game where you can just kind of simply upgrade all these units. But uh, I think I'd rather start with a skill and, and maybe get a different unit out there than 2 Sassanids, 1 Brute, and 1 Piper. Sanaa's true right here gets six Pikeneers and six Musketeers, has really good skill with guard, and then 20 defense to human troops. So she does shore up a lot of the shortcomings of this faction and giving 20 defense to all human troops. And I think that is a really, really, really strong um, wielder here because that is a great way to keep these units that have lower defense alive. And I really like that about Sanaa's. So I think that if you go with Namander, or Sanaz, you can't go wrong. Will Sil uh, Captain Xavier Silk Spool, though, is one of my favorites. So he gives us six um, Pikeneers. He gets two units of six Pikeneers, 10 offense, and then he gets melee. So let's go to melee here real quick. This is going to give a total of 20 melee offense and 10% melee resistance at the top end. I think that that is such a great starting of capability that for me, that's my number one. Captain Xavier Silk Spool is my favorite because his units are going to get all the benefit of this right at the start. He also gives us an additional order specialization, meaning you're going to have so much order essence on this character that you're going to be able to cast a lot of order spells. Xavier, for me personally, is the way to go. Then there's lastly, there's Sot4 here. Gives us two Brutes, six Pipers, scouting 20 melee offense to Harima troops. So if you want to focus on a little bit more of that glass cannon route, he's going to help here by giving you that offense versus Silk Spool is going to give you that a melee skill, which is really nice. Um, and Sanaz gives you that 20 defense to human troops. So that's the kind of the antithesis to one another. Um, two Brutes, six Pipers as well. I think, again, I think this character could go really well in your starting character because he's got scouting, so he can reveal a lot of the map quicker, and he's got a high movement at 13. So he can move around the map pretty quickly, but he also can be a really great even last wielder just to kind of have him move around the map pretty quickly for you. But those are your wielders for Baria. Moving over to spells and skills, you can see that the focus for Baria is going to primarily be on order, right? Those first three units pump out so much order. But then we jump into chaos and then into destruction to give us a lot of really great 
a variety of spells, a lot of buffing, a lot of movement, and then a lot of debuffing and damage. So, and we also have some mix of our combined spells over here on the left, like Fury, Burst of Strength, Justice, which can get better as you get the uh, increase in tiers, and then Apocalypse, Onslaught, and Rapid Fire. Uh, personally, I really like, um, where is it? Where's it? Where's it? Where's it? Where's it? Where's it? Where's it? Oh no, it's rapid fire, rapid fire. Because all friendly ranged troops get one attack, so you can really take advantage of getting a lot of damage out there. I really like this one. So, with this all being said, I think that with order, you'll find the ability to move around the map is going to be huge. And you can shore up a lot of your defense issues with the protection capability. So if you are unaware of this, the way that the tiers work in this game is, one, you have the same... Tier 1 is target friendly troop gets plus 10 defense. Tier 2, it's the same spell, but now you can target 2 units. Tier 3, again, it's the same spell, but now you can target 3 units. Or, for all of those other tiers, Tier 2 and 3, you can stack it. So you can cast it twice on 1 unit, and then for Tier 3 you can cast it 3 times on 1 unit. Or 1-1-1, one, 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 or 1-1-1, one and 1-1 one and one again on the same one. Whatever you want to do. So. I like that as a way to just kind of break up how you're casting your spells and this way you can say, hey, you know what, I've got my Pipers and I've got my Brutes. Well, I'm going to shore up the protection on both of them. Or I've got both my Dreth and my Shadows right in that front line. Well, time to double cast protection on both of them. So getting Order Rank 2, I think, is a pretty big crucial step for Baria just to get access to a lot of these buffs that are really going to help you out. Especially stuff like this too, target enemy troop gets minus 25% damage. You're not mitigating the damage with defense now, you're just outright removing the damage from the board. And then lastly, Rally. This works so well. It works so well because all friendly troops get 10 defense, 10 melee offense, and 10 ranged offense. If you combine that with your Pipers, you're basically getting a free Piper plus the, the defense. It's a great capability. Oh, I'm sorry, your, your Steam Pipers here. So if you've got two stacks of Steam Pipers, that's 20. This brings it up to 30. So you can really buff up your army really fast. And then with Chaos, you get the ability to move stuff around. Um, Chain Lightning, of course, and Blo Boiling Blood are going to be the wings that are going to help you do damage. Same thing here with Fireball from the Destruction Line and Ice Bolt. Um, I do really like this one, though. Sabotage to reduce the defensive units before I come in with the Shadow or the Dreth. And then Aggression here helps out with um, Target Friendly Troop gets 10 melee range, melee and ranged offense. So basically, a localized version of your Piper or of the Rally capability. And that's how I would really focus that when it comes to my um, uh, spells here for Baria. Switching gears over to skills. Um, I think that a big focus for your skills either needs to be on stuff like cunning, which is going to increase your melee offense, ranged offense, and defense, or melee, which is going to outright increase your melee offense. I, I really like these two um, situations because it's just such a nice bonus to the damage that they're going to be doing, right? Um, obviously, you're going to want to focus on command, get that thing up as appropriately for the amount of units that you've got. But I think that really shoring up the, um, or increasing, I guess, the damage of your actual units uh, versus, say, shoring up their defense is going to be a choice that you have to make for yourself. Um, I like I like the offense route because I'd rather just do the damage and be done with it, but you can jump into guard to get a lot of melee resistance. Uh, you can conversely kind of focus on range resistance, but I find that melee resistance is the most... Melee is the most prevalent form of damage in the game uh, because almost every single unit in every army does melee damage. It sands one or two. So out of nine units and across four factions, right? That's 36 total some odd units. And six of them, or four factions, uh, eight of them do range damage or so. And I'm just using blanket numbers. I don't know if it's actually eight. So I, I think that getting that melee resistance is a better focus here. And on top of it, combat training is another really good one because it gives you damage and also that an extra retaliation. Uh, the Dreth doesn't need to worry about that, but other things do. You can also focus on archery for your ranged offense if you want to focus on the musketeers and on the uh, hell roar. But 
I think outside of that to focusing on the order line just to get access to tier two order spells is really, really good. Also getting plus two to your order essence generation is amazing. It is amazing. Now, as far as any kind of econ goes, um, where is the one for find the meteors? Celestial ore is going to be your primary focus for producing buildings for Baria. I think that something like 30, 35 total celestial ore is required to build every single building in Baria as well as upgrade it. Might actually be 40. But either way, you're going to be using a lot of celestial ore. So if you are struggling to get it, this is going to be a very good skill for you. Also, this one up here, an eye for amber. And this is solely so that you can upgrade your brutes at a reliable rate. Getting this to a plus three on an econ wielder that is focusing on a lot of econ buffs for you is really good because it, like I said, it guarantees that you'll have ancient amber to get those brutes upgraded to the scarred brutes where they really get a lot more use for the bang bang for their buck. I think it's absolutely crucial for them. Moving into your powers, you get stuff like Attuned, which helps a lot with your um, essence generation. Brutal is going to outright increase the damage of your troops, which I really like, as I've said before, because Baria already focuses so heavily on damage, I like to double down on it. But you also get stuff like Essence Shield, which I have said before is really, really nice for a lot of melee factions. You're getting at range resistance until they get their first hit. This is going to be so crucial for your Pipers because I honestly find that Baria, Baria combat really only goes two to three rounds. It's why Cunning whoop, is so good for them because it lasts for three rounds and you get a lot of buffs on it and you can stack it up with your Pipers, with the spell Rally. It's, it's a really good way. I, I haven't found that I go into four or five rounds as often with Baria because my units either die or I kill theirs. It's one or the other. So... Essence Shield is a great way to mitigate that first combat round, or at least the first hit, of range damage. So, I really like it. I've always been really big on it. You can upgrade it again to have it last for two attacks, if you so wish. So, it's up to you. You can use stuff like Eager or Speed of the Winds to help out with troop movement, if you so wish. Um, or Rigor to help out with just outright health. But I think Brutal and Essence Shield are my two big picks here for Baria. Uh, Attuned is another one just to increase my order. Um, well, Order, Destruction, and Chaos. Uh, uh, essence Generation. I think those are, are my big picks here for my skills for Baria. Okay, for building choices, let's talk about each tier of the Baria buildings. And like I said, dude, look at Xavier with his pimp ass hat. Looks sick. So we'll click here and we'll take a look. Um, again, focusing on the two big ones the Dreth Den and the Piper's Post, we can see that it requires a lot, a lot of stone and really not a lot of wood. So I would focus, depending upon what character you've gone with, with the Dreth Den to get it upgraded as fast as possible so you get the Dire Dreths out. They're so good. I, I cannot stress enough. So I would definitely go with this as my first build and then make a stone pit to shore up my stone generation and then focus on a Piper's Post after that once I've upgraded to tier two and what have you. But getting the Dreth online as fast as possible then upgrading them is gonna be so crucial to your success as Baria. Moving into tier two, we get our first medium building, which I would personally focus on the mercenary quarters over the Fort Fortalis, Fortalis. Um, like I've said before, the Brute doesn't give me as much of a return as the um, Pike and Shot right here, the Pike and Ears, the Musketeers. Um, it, keep in mind, too, with the Fort uh, Fortalis, in order to get the, sh the Sassanids or the, eventually the Shadows, you have to research it, which costs 2500 and 5 Glimmer Weave. You might not have that at the stage in which you want to make this. That's why I think that the Mercenary Quarters, which requires the Pikeneers, only having 1500 and 5 Wood, I find that to be way more approachable and an easy get. So I would go this route um, in Tier 2. In Tier 3 is when I'd focus on the Fortalis, and I would just, again, personally, I would just completely forget about doing the Workshop, period. Um, you might like the you might like these guys more than me though. So so again, definitely go with what you want. Um, so again, mercenary quarters first. Then for my two small buildings, this is when I'm going to want to make that Piper's post to get these guys out fast and get them upgraded. And then from there, you can focus on another Dreth Den if you want to get more and more Dreth. But remember, unless you increase their capacity or you intend on having multiple stacks of them, which isn't a bad call, you might might not want to go that route because remember this is 
uh, two drafts per round every time you press end turn. In fact, I would instead probably focus on an econ building like an increase to my wood. And then in tier three, probably focus on a guard tower if you were wondering when to do that. Um, overall, the shop is something that I actually wait until a ladder tier, like tier four, tier five, or I make a small settlement somewhere out outside of mine and just focus on putting two shops there and upgrading them. I, the, the shop is not as crucial of a, a buy for me personally. Now for tier three, things are gonna get a little bit spicy because now you get your large building site. Uh, you can go with the factory if you've got the resources, you probably don't. I would just simply go with the foundry. Like I've said before, I like this more because I wanna make my units better. You can go for the Merchant's Guild, which is going to increase the capacity of your units, make your wielders have access to more essence and give you some economy buffs. But again, I just think buffing up stuff like the shadow and whatnot is just such a strong boon that I just don't sleep on this one. I get it done ASAP. Then for my medium slot, I like to go with the opposite of whatever one I didn't go with before. Again, I just, I don't touch the workshop. And then a bazaar, if you absolutely need it, I think a bazaar is better placed in a small settlement where you can access the occasional resource trading you might need to make a building that I guess you just didn't have before. Um, one thing to note that I did not mention and I completely forgot to talk about, all these things have a certain requirement when it comes to upgrading their location and I forgot uh, for the medium buildings and I forgot to talk about the shop being a requirement for the mercenary quarters upgrade so in tier two I actually would make a shop rather than a mill just so I could get access to an upgrade to the mercenary quarters getting the pikeneers upgraded as fast as possible because your base pikeneers are not as good as the upgraded version and I think that getting that online faster is better than the sawmill which produces wood for you so uh, I step back my previous recommendation there and say go with a shop in tier two so that you can take advantage of the mer the merchant mercenary quarters here um, at an upgraded uh, or a faster rate then also, if you're in tier three, make sure you take advantage of buying your walls. That is absolutely crucial because it's going to help you out if you are attacked as you'll have that natural choke point. It'll help you out when you actually do the defense of your city and such like that. So make sure you get those uh, upgraded in tier three. Doesn't need to be immediate. You know, of course, just sometime before tier four or if you're starting to get threatened, that's maybe when you pop them up, but it'll be a great boon to you defensively. So for tier four, you're gonna be getting one more medium slot and you're gonna get this small slot and this one right here. Uh, for this, this save, I hadn't made a shop to upgrade this, so I made it right here. So this is when I would go about making a guard tower in this location to help out. Um, in fact, the more I've played, the more I've learned that probably two guard towers in my main location is helpful because at top level, this is what's happening, right? You're getting these additional units per round so that when you look at your actual, the defenses of your location, it's gonna have garrison and ballistae that are gonna be present. Now, the actual units that you get with the guard tower are your pikeneers and musketeers, which aren't amazing, but if you have another thing to help support that, that's gonna be really nice. And if you have two towers on these two, not to mention the, the Great Lord of the Rings movie. If you have two of them in these two small spots, then you're gonna get 12 Pikeneers and 10 Musketeers. It's a nice, and two Ballistae, it's just a nice thing to have that you can quickly use for defense if you actually get attacked. Because remember, you also can draft troops. And personally, I find that if you have those two units that it talks about, and then just simply Dire Dreaths and Steam Pipers in your defending troops, I would make two, two stacks of, uh, of each actually. You could you can hold off a whole horde because the dryer dress are just so good. You just draft them on in. You do that. You do that. Oops. Go back to the vanity fence. And there you go. And I'd probably just do like something like this, and and have them be defensive. And it would be super beneficial. Now for your meat and building, this is when you could make your workshop or a bazaar if you wanted, but probably the workshop so you can get that all kind of uh, laid out and set. And you're all set here for tier four. The next one is Big Daddy tier five. 
So at max tier, tier five, we got one more large build site. And then we got this small build site right here. This again is a situation where if I didn't have two guard towers, I could get one. If I, if I needed another one, I could build one to have three. Just kind of use this to shore up any of the small buildings you don't have or to increase production of maybe dress if you want more or pipers if you want more. This is just kind of one of those nice catch-all build sites. If this is another fortress, you could use that for a rally point if you wanted, whatever it is really. But for that large build site, I think it makes the most sense to go with the factory. It is clear cut that that is what you're going to want to be doing. Um, the reason I wait so long to get to the factory is the cost of celestial ore. If you can get it earlier, feel free to break down the foundry and, in tier three and tier or, tier three or tier four and make the foundry there. Or I'm sorry, make the um, the factory there instead. I mean, there's nothing that stops you from just going. Oh, okay, you know what? I'm going to revert this decision. I've gotten enough research that I needed. I'll swap this out until tier five, and then I'll make my foundry over here instead. So don't ever feel like you're locked into these uh, building choices. Feel free to pivot them as you see fit. That maybe makes a little bit more sense for your, either your army, what's happening on the battle map, whatever it is. Do those decisions that kind of uh, uh, fit in with you. Um, also to something to kind of note with medium buildings. Remember with these large slots, you can make medium and small buildings in them. You don't have to be making a large building there. Um, but it is worth noting that if you have multiple bazaars, you get a better rate on buying and trading or selling. So if you're into that and you do have multiple bazaars and you have just a medium or large slot, and you're not sure where to fix, fill it with, pop a bazaar in there to, to get better prices on things until you needed an actual that slot for something in specific so that just kind of a little side nugget i wanted to give you a bit of information on but that figures that that kind of fills out how to build out all of the tiers of your baria buildings so there you have it everything you needed to know about baria all in one conclusive little video here <laughs> so if you have any other questions about baria go ahead and let me know in the comment section below like i said baria is a is a a bit different of a faction, a little bit more difficult in the sense that you do have to wrap your brain around uh, a different approach. Your units are not very durable, they don't have a lot of health, they have pretty interesting uh, defense, um, and you're really going to be spending a lot of time trying to position properly and do a ton of damage. And once you learn how to buff things with those pipers, how to use those dress and those uh, shadows to really get a ton of value from them, you really will be able to mince your way through most armies because you are not as reliant on other portions of the army in the way that say Arleon does where hey yeah you've got this one unit with a shield cool it's strictly a defensive unit it can do a lot of good damage but it requires the damage to come from other sources or it requires the range support all that stuff Baria does a really good job of being strong with a good amount of utility but you just have to use that utility in a smart way but thank you so much for watching here today guys as i've said before don't forget to uh, comment like subscribe all that fun action if you have any questions let it be known in that comment section below if you've already picked up songs of conquest and you really love the game the best way to support the developers is by leaving a steam review good bad meh whatever it is just let it be known because it does help out in pushing that uh that game to kind of the front of the list when it comes to steam but as always thank you so much for watching here today have a good one and take care